usual early. I'd like to welcome His Holiness to this third session of Investigating the Mind Dialogues. If you're wondering, gosh, it's not yet 9 o'clock, it's still 10 to 9, you're correct. Uh, this is exactly like it would be in Dharamsala, where the meetings can start anywhere from 10 to a half an hour early, based on His Holiness's schedule and his interest and excitement about the next topic. <laughs> This morning we are gathered to take up the theme of emotion from both the Buddhist and Western scientific perspectives. Before we move there, though, I'd first need to do one or two pieces of housekeeping for us. Uh, for those of you who are interested in the audio tapes and you'd like to take them home with you today, please place your order in the lobby no later than 1.30 today. Also, Today's program this morning will go through till 11.30. As before, there will be an opportunity for the audience to pose questions. We'd like to ask that the questions for this session be targeted to the theme of the session, that is to say, to the theme of emotions. There will be an opportunity in the fourth session for you to pose more general questions to the group that will be up here for that final session. I'd like now to introduce the speakers and panelists. Uh, to my right is the scientific presenter for today's discussion, Professor Richard Davidson of the University of Wisconsin in Madison. He's a professor of psychology there and also director of the Keck Laboratory for Functional Brain Imaging and Behavior. To his right is Daniel Kahneman. He'll be known as Danny, since we have two different Daniels uh, on the panel. So Danny's from Princeton University, where he holds professorships in both psychology and public affairs. He's also the recipient of the 2002 Nobel Prize for Economics. Then to his right is Dacker Keltner, who is a professor of psychology at the University of California in Berkeley. And to his right is Dan, Daniel, or Dan Gilbert, professor of psychology at Harvard University. Speaking for the Buddhist side uh, will be our friend George Dreyfus, who's a professor and is also chair of the religion department at Williams College, was himself a monk for many years before becoming a professor at Williams, studying and becoming a professor there. Of course, His Holiness will be on that panel as well. And then we have familiar, the familiar faces of Alan Wallace and Matthew Ricard. With that, we'll begin our morning session with a presentation from George Dreyfus. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, I'm going to shift here a little bit and talk from a slightly different angle uh, today that is mostly philosophical, and by philosophical here I mean not Western philosophy, but Buddhist philosophy. So what I'm going to try to do is uh, present a, a Buddhist view uh, of the mind and a, a Buddhist way of thinking uh, about emotion. Uh, so let me start right away by uh, a kind of shocking revelation. My title is, Does Buddhism anything, has, Have Anything to Say About Emotions? And, and the first, my first point will be that, uh, actually, if you look at Tibetan Buddhist tradition, it's impossible to find a single word which would uh, uh, translate or even resemble the concept of emotion. Now, this is probably very surprising to several of you, since emotion seems to be such a basic way of, uh, uh, for which uh, uh, modern uh, Westerners understand themselves. But there is no term in the uh, traditional Tibetan Buddhist 
uh, vocabulary which come close to that. And so starting from that, I would like to develop a reflection on how uh, we can conceptualize uh, uh, the uh, uh, place nature of emotion from a Buddhist perspective and what does Buddhism have to offer about that, hence my title. Now, the first point I would like to make is that though uh, concepts as, as emotion may seem to be self-evident and freestanding, they are actually not. Rather, they presuppose a whole mental typology uh, uh, in which uh, emotions is opposed to other factors. And here I have laid out a, a very ancient uh, Western uh, uh, mental typology, the threefold division of the soul in Plato's Republic, in which reason, high-spiritedness, passion, that is emotion more or less, and appetite, uh, distinguished. Now, obviously, the Buddhist view is going to look very different, and this is what I would like to present today, a, typo a Buddhist typology of the mind. Now, before going into that, let me emphasize that what I'm going to say is just a Buddhist view. It is not the Buddhist view. It's a very ancient Buddhist view. It's a very basic Buddhist view, which is common to Tibetan, uh, Theravada and probably parts of the Chinese and Japanese Buddhist tradition, but it's not the only view. Yesterday we, t we saw discussion about the difference between exoteric Buddhism and esoteric Buddhism. And what we are talking about here is the view of the mind uh, in the exoteric tradition, more particularly in the Abhidharma tradition, a name which has already come uh, yesterday. So let me make a few brief points about uh, the Abhidharma. Uh, history. Abhidharma is one of the three parts of the Buddhist canon. It is uh, an element of the canon which goes back to probably a few centuries after uh, uh, the passing away of the Buddha. Uh, the authors that we are going, uh, I am going to refer mostly today, or at least implicitly, I, however, are quite later, they're in the 4th, 5th century uh, of the Common Era. Their name is Asanga and Vasubandhu. They are two brothers, and they represent very well the kind of profound uh, Buddhist culture and uh, uh, institu in intellectual culture that uh, His Holiness was talking about yesterday. Now, the content of the Abhidharma, what is the Abhidharma about? Well, the Abhidharma is an extensive typology of mental and physical phenomena. The Abhidharma uh, examines uh, the, uh, uh, the experience, focus on experience, but not just mental experience, the whole range of experience, meaning experience and the world as it's given uh, through experience. And in doing so, the Abhidharma uh, proceed in a very uh, characteristic way, which is by extensive list. For any phenomena, the Abhidharma breaks down this phenomena it's into its basic uh, constituents. So uh, the Abhidharma is often thought to be very tedious, and in some way it is. The classic, one of the jokes that people like to say, talk or say about Buddhism is that Buddhism don't have God, but they surely do have lists. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and, and this is, if it's true of any part of the Buddhist tradition, it's certainly true of, uh, of the Abhidharma. So be forewarned, my talk will be mostly about a bunch of lists, but with this PowerPoint presentation, I think I will be able to get through. Now, the philosophy of the Abhidharma, I think, is quite interesting and important and relevant to a discussion here. Uh, I would distinguish two parts. The Abhidharma analyzes experience into, in com into, in com into its components, sorry. And the idea in analyzing uh, uh, experience into its component is to undermine the idea of a unified subject, of unified self. So the main goal of the Abhidharma is to break down experience so that uh, the idea of the self is uh, uh, undermined, breaks down, and so on. Now, in thinking about the component, I think it's also important to understand that the Abhidharma is not talking about static uh, 
entity like atoms and so on, but it's talking, though it may use the, the language of the atom, but it's talking about dynamically related events. So the components of the Abhidharma are not uh, 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 static substances, but they are to be thought as events, either material or mental events, which are dynamically interrelated. So hence my uh, summarization here of uh, the Abhidharma philosophy under the rubric of non-substantiality or no self, and with the flip side, which is the idea of dependent arising or dependent origination. Okay. Now we have a very rough idea of the Abhidharma. Let's look at the Abhidharmic view of the mind. And sometimes the Abhidharma is often glossed as Buddhist psychology, and it's certainly in part true because the analysis of the mind is certainly the central piece of the Abhidharma. Now, how does the Abhidharma conceive of the mind? Well, it doesn't conceive the mind as a mechanism or as a static entity, but rather is a succession of intentional states. The mind is made by mental states which are in principle, at least phenomenology available, at least in principle, not necessarily in actuality, but in principle can be available to introspection. These uh, mental states arise one after another in quick succession. They are causally interrelated. Uh, also, these mental states are intentional, that is, they bear on an object. So, the way we should think of the mind here is a little bit like James thought of it as a mental continuum, as a stream of mental states which are, uh, uh, arise in very quick. Uh, 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 succession in have a causal relation. So we shouldn't think of the mind as being something stable, substantial, but rather it is very unstable, constantly changing stream of mental events. Now, each of these mental events can be thought to have two aspects. One is what I have called awareness. The other is mental factors. Now, awareness is the aspect of the mental state which is merely aware of the object, which is merely presence in the object. So uh, it's not a full-blown cognition, it's just a mere uh, awareness uh, of the uh, object. And uh, in the Buddhist, uh, at least to simplify it, in one of the Buddhist Abhidharma, uh, there are six types of consciousness, five sensory uh, or six types of awareness, sorry, five sensory awareness and one mental uh, awareness as I have laid out here. Now, each mental state uh, implies a, a, a primary factor of awareness, but it's not just a mere awareness of that object. That awareness comes together with a certain number of other aspects which I have called mental factors. This is the usual uh, translation in English of a Buddhist term. It is in some way misleading because mental factors implies a kind of causal uh, uh, efficacy, and it's actually part of it, but it also has to be understood as an aspect of each mental cognition or each mental state. So each mental state comes with, uh, with a series of mental factors which characterize the object, qualify the, uh, uh, the cognition. The cognition is not mere awareness, but engage in the object in particular way. For example, the object feels pleasant or unpleasant. The mind, the mental state is distracted, uh, undistracted. Uh, the mental state is agitated with desire with anger. On the contrary, the mental state is peaceful and so on. All these different qualitative differences are uh, due to uh, the mental factors. Now, the Abhidharma in its very characteristic form is going to study mental factors by listing them. So here we go, 51 mental factors. <laughs> And to, to make sense of these 51 mental factors, 
uh, I'm going to group them into three types of uh, uh, mental factors which will uh, uh, make clear the nature of uh, uh, the Abhidharma interest in the variety of mental factors. So there is going to be a, a group called, which I call here the neutral factors, and they are, they are various factors, but they mostly pertain to the functioning uh, of uh, the mind. And then after this neutral factor, we're going to look at vir what I call virtuous factors and afflictive factors. Now if you look at the numbers, you realize that actually the Abhidharma is Cent this, this typology is centrally organized around this distinction between virtuous and afflictive factors. So how do we distinguish uh, afflictive from virtuous factors? Well, I, here I gave a definition. Afflictive factors disturb the mind, the body, create frustration, restlessness, etc., for oneself and others. Virtuous factors, on the other hand, are those that tend to promote well-being, leading to peace and calm for oneself and others. Uh, what I, so, uh, uh, what I want to emphasize is that distinction uh, uh, is obviously ethical. It is an ethical distinction between the uh, wholesome and the whole unwholesome side. This distinction is based on the effect of the, these factors on the mind of uh, 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 the person. The afflictive factor disturb the mind and so on. The virtuous factor tend to promote well-being, peace, and so on. Now, in, in giving that uh, uh, definition, I want to emphasize that by peace, I do not mean disactivation of the mind, but I do mean uh, to signal a kind of calm, relaxed state in which the person is free to engage uh, uh, the world, other, uh, uh, others, and so on. So by peace, I do not want to uh, suggest the traditional stereotypes of Buddhists who are just, uh, 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 just meditating and doing nothing else. Rather, the idea is very much openness. In fact, the key word I think here is freedom. Afflictive uh, factors are the factors which compels us, disturbs us, lead us into states we don't really want to, to go. Uh, for example, we don't necessarily want to get angry, we just get angry. And this is what an afflictive factor is. It's a factor uh, which binds us, which uh, 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 prevents us from uh, remaining free and open. On the other hand, the virtuous factors are those which tend to promote openness, calm, and so on. Okay, now let me come back to my list of uh, 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 mental factors after having defined, uh, given these few definitions. And let me say a few words about a couple of the uh, neutral factors. Uh, there are five omnipresent mental factors, meaning they are factors which are present with any, in any kind of uh, uh, mental state. Then there are factors which are called determining factors, uh, 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 which are factors which uh, are present in mental states which have a, a more definite, determined grasp on the object. And then there is a variable factors we don't really need to get in today. Now, let me say a few words about a couple of these factors which I have underlined. First, let me emphasize the very important place of feeling or sensation depending on the translation. Every mental state is not just uh, a pure aware, uh, uh, an awareness of the object, but that awareness comes with a feeling tone. The object feels pleasant, it feels unpleasant, or it feels neutral. So this is a very important factor. As you see, it's listed as number one. This is obviously, there is a reason for that, and that reason is multiple. One is that uh, uh, beings, uh, such as ourselves in Buddhism, are understood as sentient beings, that is, beings who have feeling, beings for whom happiness and, uh, 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 happiness and suffering are foremost uh, issues. So we have feeling. Uh, this uh, feeling also plays a very important role in Buddhist psychology in its relation with afflictive factors, and I will talk about those uh, shortly. Uh, 
Let me also uh, underline the role of a few other factors we have talked about yesterday, and I will keep talking about that. One is attention. Uh, every mental state, however diffuse, has a minimal level of attention. And then in the determining factor, let me emphasize the role of mindfulness, concentration, and intelligence factors, which we have already talked about yesterday, but which I am going to come back shortly. Let me move on then to this distinction between virtuous and uh, uh, afflictive factors. And I'm not going to go through the list. I want to, uh, in the list here, I want to emphasize a couple of items, uh, particularly in uh, loving kindness and compassion, uh, because from a, a, a Western perspective, often it's, uh, it's thought that loving kindness and compassion are emotions. So obviously, we see here some emotions uh, coming up here, and this is obviously very important. Notice, however, that there are other uh, uh, factors such as confidence of faith uh, and wisdom which are not uh, uh, emotion. So these are some of the positive uh, virtuous uh, uh, factors and among those obviously loving kindness and compassion plays a particular central role to which I'm going to come back. In contrast to the virtuous You can go on. In, in contrast to the virtuous factors, we have the afflictions. And here there are 26 afflictions. And so you can see immediately that defining this affliction, uh, 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 distinguishing them, and so on, uh, is very much a concern of uh, uh, the Abhidharma. And uh, here again, I'm not going to go for the list of 26, but I'm going to uh, emphasize the role of a couple of these uh, uh, of, of these afflictions. Attachment, anger, ignorance. This is a, 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 a triplet, very famous triplet in the, in the whole of Buddhist tradition. And I think it's very important to understand what Buddhism means by uh, by freedom, by peace, by happiness, and so on, because it's in contradistinction to these factors that these notions are going to become uh, clearer. So, attachment, anger, in a way, they go together. And these factors, uh, uh, these afflictions, bear a particular relation to the feeling or sensation that I laid out as the first of the omnipresent mental factor. And the reason is that if we uh, uh, look at our uh, common experience, at least if I look at my experience, I can see that uh, very often, or for most of the time, when I have a pleasant feeling, I want that pleasant feeling to continue. I want that pleasant feeling to be stronger. I want to be happier, and uh, so on. So immediately, as soon as uh, a pleasantness is coming around, attachment arise in my mind. On the contrary, if unpleasantness comes around, then aversion, anger uh, arise in my mind. I don't want it. Uh, I, I, I want to be rid of it. I want to be free of it, and so on. So these uh, are very deep-rooted um, conditioning in their mind. Uh, deep-rooted conditioning, uh, I use the word because it's very clear that it's, we don't choose to be attached, we don't choose to be angry, we just are. And these factors uh, uh, arise very, in very, very close connection to uh, the factor feelings. And so this is a very important connection. Now, together with anger uh, and attachment, we need to think about ignorance uh, in Buddhist terms. Uh, this is a, a very important uh, 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 term because uh, we could ask, why do we have anger and attachment? And the Buddhist answer is that we have anger and attachment because we grasp to uh, this uh, stuff, this mental stuff and material stuff, which is made of many, many factors. There are many factors in the mental, and there are many parts to the material stuff either. So we have all this stuff, and this stuff is kind of working uh, uh, in a, a, a causal way. But we conceive of this uh, stuff as being ourselves. We conceive of this stuff as being this solid, 
substance, which is me, me the king, me who is in charge, who is controlling. Somebody yesterday was talking about uh, what is the CEO of the mind. Well, from the Buddhist point of view, there is no CEO. The mind is this kind of committee where many factors kind of compete, try to outstage each other. It's a very unstable committee. It managed to do a fair amount of stuff, but there is certainly no king who is there in charge, because this idea of the king is, for Buddhism, uh, the root uh, uh, of all problems. Because once we conceive ourselves as this, uh, as this self, as this ego, then that ego needs uh, stuff, needs to be bigger, nicer, richer, more admired, and so on. And on the other hand, uh, this king also uh, needs to be protected, because as soon as something is uh, threatening, I oh, need protection, and this is what anger is trying to do, is trying to protect the king. But this is obviously a deluded protection, and it's a protection which leads to more problem than it solves. So this is the basic idea. And out of these three uh, 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 delusion comes uh, the, uh, uh, the rest of all these uh, afflictions. OK, now why talk, uh, 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 why this mental typology? What is the goal of the Abhidharma in uh, 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 talking about all these different factors? Well, the goal of the Abhidharma is clearly to support the meditative practices that Buddhism sees as uh, essential to uh, fulfill uh, 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 the, uh, the goal of uh, 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 people, of sentient beings. Now. Uh, this practice can be fought in many ways. One of the ways in which the Abhidharma often talk about is the promotion of wholesome factor and the undermining and elimination of negative factors. And this is one good way to think about that. So the goal of the Abhidharma is clearly to lay out this very complex mental typology so that the practice uh, can be clearly uh, delineated in terms of which factors need to be supported and strengthened and which factors need to be undermined and uh, 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 eventually eliminated. Now, if we think about how these factors, positive factors, are going to work, or if we think about this whole program, uh, we can think about a there are a couple of ways in which uh, 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 we can work with uh, uh, afflictions. And, and I guess this is here with the notion of emotions. Uh, 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 um, can come to, to bear. Uh, let me maybe backtrack. I forgot to say one thing, which is that if you look at this list of afflictions, you see that there are a number of emotions. Uh, hence, sometimes this is translate as negative emotions, but also you see that there are a number of factors such as ignorance, but such as drowsiness and uh, such as uh, excitement and laziness and so on, which are not uh, emotions. So you clearly see my point, which is that uh, even that list of afflictions uh, doesn't really map into our concept of uh, uh, the Western modern concept of emotion. OK, so how do we deal with uh, these afflictions uh, and some of, it, uh, of these afflictions being uh, emotion? One way in which we deal with them is by using the antidote. That is, we use we, to uh, 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 deal with an affliction such as anger, for example, we, we use its opposite, which is loving kindness and compassion. And so there are a number of uh, meditations, and maybe some of my colleagues in the question and answer can elaborate on that, in which, uh, this, uh, 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 in which m compassion is developed and how compassion helps the person to develop this positive uh, 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 factors with positive emotions, which in turn produce a great deal of benefit for the person himself or herself, for others, and helps certainly to deal with some of these negative emotions. Now, there is a, 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 another way, a more radical way, in a way, uh, uh, to deal with emotion. And this is, in a way, the heart of the Buddhist tradition, though compassion is clearly central uh, as well, but it's the idea of really uh, removing this affliction. And this, uh, to remove this affliction, I have laid out uh, the simplest version 
of uh, uh, the, the, the path, the program, which needs to be followed in order to uh, remove this infection. And this is what uh, 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 my colleague Alan has already talked about, the threefold training of ethics or morality, concentration, and wisdom uh, born from inside. Now, I want to make a couple of points here before uh, concluding uh, by emphasizing the role of ethics uh, in the Buddhist view of how to deal with uh, afflictive emotions. The goal, as I try to underline, is not pleasure, is not joy, it's happiness, but happiness understood as well-being, meaning a kind of long, and, and the, this well-being, I think, is best classed as freedom, freedom from the compulsions, which brings us to suffering. And so that kind of freedom has to be, if we want to free our mind, we first need to uh, eliminate the kind of coarsest level of, inter, uh, of interference, which is the, all, uh, the unethical behavior and attitudes we engage in. Because it's clear that if I am going to, to behave uh, like uh, uh, I was going to say a pig, I don't want to insult pigs, but anyway. Uh, <laughs> it, I mean, the I, there is no way I'm going to be able to reach calmness, even, freedom, like and so on. So the whole thing is very much rooted uh, in uh, 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 ethics. And then the next step is concentration, and I have uh, uh, put that uh, mindfulness and uh, uh, my colleague yesterday talked already about it, so I don't need to say very much. I want to emphasize that uh, by concentration, we do not just mean the kind of narrowing and tightening of the mind, but we mean developing on a kind of focused but balanced attitude, which is poised and, and very soothing and peaceful to the person who develops uh, that attitude. This is, I think, a very important factor in dealing with emotions. Because yesterday we talked a little bit about attention and the role of attention, but I think another fact, other factors need to be brought to deal when we want to deal with emotion. And a very important one is this kind of uh, poise of the mind. Uh, which we call concentration. And also I would bring uh, mindfulness together because metacognitive uh, 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 factors, and my, uh, you, Alan talked about uh, meta-attention, and meta-attention and mindfulness go together, are very, very important. The difference between a teenager uh, who is attentive to a video game and a meditator is very great difference. And one of these difference is the, the play of uh, such metacognitive uh, uh, factors such as meta-attention and, meta, uh, uh, and mindfulness. So these are very important uh, elements in dealing with uh, uh, the, uh, the emotions. Finally, uh, the, the, the culmination in a way, the program, wisdom often combined with compassion and uh, wisdom born from insight. And here by this I mean uh, to eliminate uh, completely the uh, disturbing mental uh, factors, uh, we need to uh, go at the root of these mental factors, which is this self-grasping. And to undermine this self-grasping, uh, we need to familiarize ourselves and experience this reality with which the Abhidharma is trying to uh, capture conceptually. But obviously what we need is non-conceptual experience of this no-self, non-substantial reality of interdependent uh, physical and mental events. And when we gain really experience into that uh, reality, into that uh, non-substantial reality, then at that point the ignorance is uh, undermined and removed and then uh, real freedom uh, can be reached. So this is uh, basically what I want to talk about. I think my presentation raised a few questions for uh, you guys. <laughs> and uh, 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 or for everybody, in fact, maybe. Uh, let me uh, 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 outline a couple of the questions which seems to be very relevant. One is about maybe the, what we could call the phenomenology of the affective domain. That is, often I get the impression that uh, 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 psychology talks about, Western psychology talks about uh, emotion is this kind of short-term event which bursts uh, very quickly. 
And so now this is certainly uh, uh, one way of looking at it. I think it's clear that the mind can be parsed in many different ways. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily mean that there is a right way or wrong way. But it seems to me here there is a very different way, a much more integrated way to look at the uh, affective as uh, uh, within the whole range of the mental. And I think that this, is a very, uh, this seems to me an important point if we want to understand the whole range of what we mean by the affective or maybe the emotional. So this is one set of questions which I think is relevant. Another set of questions maybe from the Buddhist side is uh, I think His Holiness and myself and probably many people, here, Buddhist people here, are very curious to know whether these distinctions, some of these distinctions, uh, have any kind of neuro, uh, neurological, neurobiological correlates uh, or not. So this is uh, one kind of uh, a very, uh, a very interesting question, at least for me. Uh, a third type of question, I think, is much broader, and maybe we'll talk about this more this afternoon, which is uh, the relation between ethics and psychology. I, I think that, and, and here I'm talking more specifically about psychology, though I think that's a problem for all the science in, in general, but I think because uh, I mean, if we say, uh, if we agree with uh, uh, the way Evans has talked about how we study the mind, which is by kind of bringing together the first person and the third person standpoint, it seems to me it's going to be extremely difficult to evacuate any kind of ethical concern because in as much as the first standpoint is, uh, 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 is involved, it's, it is an interpretive standpoint which has obviously uh, uh, in uh, uh, ethical consequence. And I think often uh, a, a very uh, large question, which is obviously not new, but which seems to me very central to conversation is, uh, is it really possible or is it even desirable to uh, uh, do psychology uh, without any kind of, uh, by abstracting uh, uh, any kind of uh, 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 ethical consideration? Thank you. Thank you very much. Your Holiness, uh, there are four things that I wish to accomplish today in my talk. Uh, the first is to describe some key conceptions of emotion that uh, have been provided by Western science. The second is to begin to try to respond to the radically different conceptualization of emotion that we've heard from Georges and that have been presented to us uh, by the dialogue with the Buddhists. The third issue that I'd like to do is to raise some key questions that have been posed by this juxtaposition of the Buddhist challenge to Western science of emotion. And the fourth thing that I'd like to do is to show you some new findings that we've obtained uh, in our experiments with monks that bear, we think, on some of these issues. How is emotion thought about in the West? There are three things that I've listed here. One is that it's a mental state with a valenced quality. And by, Explain. But by valenced, we mean uh, a positive or negative. <laughs> In the sense of happiness or joyful or... Yes, and, uh, and I'll, I will elaborate on that in, in just a moment. The second is that emotion is often associated with a bodily reaction. 
And the third is that emotion is often associated with outward expressive signs. William James, who we've heard much about throughout this meeting, uh, who is someone that many of us look up to as a great American psychologist, uh, in his Principles of Psychology, uh, which was written in 1890, he has a long chapter on emotion, and he presents a particular view of emotion which emphasizes the importance of the bodily response. And for James, uh, what he says is illustrated in this little cartoon. And what it means is that information comes in from the world, and that is, whoops, that is denoted by the sensory receptor here. And so information may come in through the eyes. And it goes up to the brain. And then the brain sends signals down to the body, which are illustrated in these pathways that are labeled number two here. It goes to the visceral organs like the heart, and it also goes to the muscles in the arms and the legs. And for James, the signals are sent from the brain to the body, and the body reacts. And then there are signals that go from the body, from the viscera and from the muscles, back up to the brain and it is the interpretation of those bodily signals that constitutes emotion. So James once said that we don't see a bear and then fe experience fear and then run. What he has said is we might see the bear, we might start running and feel our heart beating, and then the fear arises from the perception of the bodily changes. So the importance of this is just to underscore the role of the body in Western conceptions of emotion. Another key question that Western scientists have asked is whether emotions are discrete, whether they're categorical, uh, or whether they are more dimensional. By categorical, we mean emotions like happiness, sadness, anger, fear, disgust. Those are considered by some psychologists basic emotions. And Paul Ekman, who you know, has been a pioneer in the study of emotion from this perspective. These discrete emotions are said to have distinctive facial components and vocal components. And one of the questions which scientists uh, have, uh, have asked is whether the face can be used as a signpost to signify the presence of an emotion. And there are dimensional perspectives that emphasize a very small number of dimensions of emotion. And the two dimensions which have been emphasized the most are valence, which is this positive-negative distinction. Uh, and this, the second dimension has been called arousal, which is how, um, how active the emotion is. So it would go from very calm to very, very energized or active. <laughs> Now, the classical Western conception has emphasized this dimension of valence. And we are beginning now to consider the challenge that has been posed by our interactions with the Buddhists to think about another important dimension and maybe a central 
a, a dimension of central importance being virtuous versus non-virtuous or virtuous versus afflictive. So how does the traditional conception look more specifically? This is a model which many psychologists have um, described. And uh, I can very briefly uh, walk everyone through this. And what we have on one axis is activation or arousal. And on the top, uh, we see emotions that are very highly activated. So there are emotions that include being nervous on the negative side and being elated or very excited on the positive side. And then um, down below are emotions that are deactivated, where there is lower arousal. So on the positive side, emotions like being calm and serene, and on the negative side, um, depressed and fatigued. Uh, and so this two by two, meaning uh, a dimension of valence going from positive to negative uh, or unpleasant to pleasant here, and a dimension of activation or arousal going from high arousal to low arousal is a very dominant conception of emotion in Western psychology. Now, the way we think about the relation of dimensions to discrete emotions is illustrated here. And one of the things that is immediately apparent is the paucity of positive emotions that have been studied in the West. So we have positive emotions uh, on one side. Just two that have really been studied. Happiness and amusement. <laughs> We've spent much more time studying negative emotions, uh, like fear and anger and sadness and disgust. Now, how would a different conception look? This is a Buddhist-inspired model with virtuous and non-virtuous or afflictive emotions. It would be a very different conceptualization, a very different way of parsing the space of emotion. And one of the things that uh, we are inspired to one of the things that we're inspired to do now is to see whether if we parse emotion in this way, do our measurements of brain activity fall better into place than when we parse it in the traditional Western conception? That is a question which we do not yet have the answer to. An important question which arises from this dialogue is whether there are unique facial signs of virtuous emotions. Is there a facial sign of compassion or of other virtuous emotions? Um, Your Holiness, I'd like to show you a little video clip that came from our laboratory. And it's a little, looks a little funny. It's Matthew. <laughs> This is Matthew, where... <laughs> we are measuring his brain activity during a experiment where at this point he is not doing any specific practice, but in just a few moments he is going to be receiving an instruction to generate pure compassion, something that um, in your tradition uh, is a very well-practiced skill. And one of the, he just received that instruction. Now, in the Western tradition, it's been said that facial expressions of emotion never last for more than three or four seconds. Notice the lip corners on Matthew. They're slightly raised, and the eyes are, have a slight contraction, which is a facial sign 
of positive emotion, and this just goes on and on and on. <laughs> Does not change for the entire period during which we are recording. And that's the end of the experiment now. So, I'd like now to move on to another question, and that is a very difficult question for the dialogue between Buddhists and Western um, approaches to emotion, which I'm sure will come up in our discussion. Emotions, by and large, in the West are conceptualized in an evolutionary framework. And we know that uh, even in young toddlers and children, there are emotions that we see, facial signs of anger uh, and of fear, emotions of that sort. And so one of the questions which we keep asking ourselves is, what is the evolutionary role for non-virtuous emotions like anger and fear? And a question that I'd like to pose to all of us is whether these emotions are perhaps important during early development when children are growing up, but become more destructive later in life, or whether they are always destructive, including in infancy and early childhood. I'm sure that um, uh, Jerome Kagan, who will be on the panel in the afternoon, is a developmental psychologist who've spent his career studying these issues, and he will, I'm sure, have something to say about this too. The other question I'd like to raise, which we have raised earlier in, in our dialogues, which has become extremely important in helping me and several of my colleagues to think about emotions which we normally think of as destructive, is whether there is a root component of anger that can be used skillfully to overcome obstacles that may not be destructive. And so on this view, what may be part of our evolutionary heritage is an emotion which is important in overcoming obstacles, but that it need not be associated with the destructive and the violent quality that anger has become associated with particularly in our culture. And so the question is whether the destructive component of anger is something that has been learned through participation in our culture, but in other cultures, there may still be an emotion which helps us overcome obstacles, a skillful wrath, perhaps, but not anger in the sense that we normally think of it. Another very important question that has been stimulated by our dialogue is what the role of consciousness is in emotion. Are there non-conscious emotions? Some Western... Some, some Western scientists have made the distinction between feeling and emotion. Feeling is when an emotion becomes conscious. But emotion may be the bodily reaction, the facial cues, which may not necessarily always be conscious. An important related question is what the 
utility of becoming conscious of emotion might be. It, do, is it the case that when we become conscious of emotion, we are better able to regulate or to control emotion? And also, which components of emotion may be most available to our conscious experience? Some may be trainable through practice. Others may be more opaque to consciousness, less available to consciousness. And that's something... Now, we've heard a lot about first-person accounts of experience and the role of introspection. And we have a number of distinguished panelists who have studied very carefully uh, the nature of first-person accounts of emotion. And one of the discoveries that um, the scientists have made is that people who are untrained, at least, in the West, are very poor at retrospective accounts of emotion. So that if if Individuals are also poor at predicting how they will feel in response to some future situation. One important question for us is whether highly trained meditators are less subject to these biases. It's a question which we can now study. Now, we also have heard a distinction between, and George talked about this, between emotions being short term just coming on and coming off quickly versus more continuous. Most emotion research has treated emotions as very brief and episodic. They come on and come off very quickly. But emotion can also be thought of in a way which is more consistent, I think, with the Buddhist framework, and many scientists are beginning to think about it in this way, as a quality that is more continuous and may be present in virtually all mental activity. Now, following from this, we can think of emotions not just as states, but also a term that we use in the West is traits. Um, by traits, we mean things that are enduring over time. <laughs> So traits often refer to temperamental qualities, like a person being shy or very cheerful. And these qualities persist over, over time and across different situations. Uh, so the question for us is, can these traits be changed? Can meditation be used to transform these traits? That's a question in which we're very interested because Western psychology often thinks about these traits as being relatively fixed, relatively immutable. And we would be interested to know whether training can actually change these traits. Another concept related to this is something that some of our panelists have explored, 
uh, and it's been referred to as the hedonic treadmill. Um, and what the hedonic treadmill refers to is uh, if you receive some positive um, reward, you show a change in your level of happiness, but it doesn't last. It comes back down relatively quickly, and then you want more. And in many ways, this is a Western uh, model of craving and attachment. Do you want to give an example of lottery winners? Pardon? Do you want to give an example of lottery winners? Yes. So one, one example that's been studied, Your Holiness, is with lottery winners. And a person who wins the lottery and gets a great big sum of money feels much happier for a very short period of time. But then their level of happiness begins to subside back down to where they were before. And so then they would need even more money to feel happy again. <laughs> so the question is, is there a way out? Is there such a thing as genuine happiness that is not subject to hedonic adaptation? Can happiness in this sense, and this is something very new for Western science, can happiness be conceptualized not as a state or a trait, but as a skill? As a skill which can potentially be trained. One of the questions that we've been interested in in, in my laboratory is what is the impact of training the mind on brain signals? that are associated with emotion. And what I'd like to do in the next couple of minutes is just share with you some very new findings that um, have been gathered um, with the help of Mathieu uh, and other llamas that we've had come to our laboratory and participate in some of this research. And I want to first emphasize that the nature of this collaboration has been extremely unusual. Um, we've had <laughs> Mathieu getting um, wired up in the laboratory. Uh, here he is um, receiving some instructions. And this is Matthew after he just came out of the MRI scanner after being in there for a little over three hours uh, the first time, smiling. Um, <laughs> most people don't come out this way. <laughs> but then we have had llamas who became experimenters. Uh, and this is an actual picture in our laboratory uh, of us testing um, where we have um, uh, recruited uh, our visitors to become experimenters, not just subjects. They are experimenters, they're collaborators in every sense of the word. Now this just illustrates a very, very simple design that we began our research with. Um, uh, and it, it's the most basic, simple place we could start. And what we are interested in doing is to compare a neutral state with a meditation state. And so what we did is we alternated a neutral state with a meditation state several times when um, the monks were either uh, wired up with electrical recording or in the MRI scanner. And one of the um, states that we were very interested in is um, what has been called open presence. And I will not try to define that. I will let my Buddhist colleagues define that. Um, but it's a state of, for, for the audience, it is a state, as I understand it, of pure awareness where there is, where the mind does not react um, uh, in a, the mind doesn't get pulled by emotions, or by other kinds of external or internal events that are occurring. And so, in the second meditation practice. You just want to represent it. Represent it. Represent it. And the second meditation practice that we studied is the generation of compassion. And so the first thing I'd like to do is show you one, this is just from one of our um, monks. Uh, and it is a 
What is displayed here is a metric of brain activity that we have studied in our laboratory previously that has been associated with um, certain kinds of positive emotion. And the more left-sided activation in prefrontal regions that we see, that has been associated with increased levels of certain types of positive emotion. And that's what we see plotted down here. And what's this distribution, this curve, is the frequency at each of these different points of activation for a group of 150 untrained people. <coughs> And this is the data point for our monk who was in the lab. Um, it, is, it is off the curve completely. So the, the, the significance of this is that the, the, the untrained individuals form this normal distribution, but the monk generating compassion is so extreme in this pattern of brain activity that um, it is beyond what any untrained person uh, among these 150 that we've tested. <laughs> Now, during the generation of open presence, we're finding a change in an area of the brain that normally assigns emotional value. And this is averaged now across the six monks that we've had tested in our laboratory. All of them are showing this change. So this is now, for the first time, we have data from a whole group of monks. Um, and it's showing a change in the brain in this area that normally assigns emotional value. So when, it, when, a, when a person receives a stimulus or has a thought, there is an, a normal reaction to classify it or to have a feeling of whether it's positive or negative. And what is being indicated here is that the part of the brain that normally assigns this kind of emotional value is diminished in its activation during open presence. Now, Your Holiness, another kind of experiment that we did is very similar where we have the monks either in a neutral state or a meditation state, but then we present certain stimuli to them to challenge their emotions. And this is kind of like a cardiac stress test for the emotional brain. Cardiac stress test. I'll need the sound. So, your Holiness, we played for them sounds that sound like this. A baby laughing or somebody screaming. Uh, and that was played while they were in the MRI scanner to see how it perturbed the mind. And what we found is that during... Um, while in meditation. While in meditation. Mm -hmm. uh, and what we found is that there were a series of changes. I won't go through all the different brain regions, but a series of changes in areas of the brain that respond to emotion. And what we saw when we compared the meditation state to the control state is that there was a decrease specifically an activation in those areas of the brain that normally react to these emotional sounds. Yeah. Now, during compassion, in response to these same sounds during compassion, we find an increase in activation 
in an area of the brain that is similar to what we, uh, what we showed you with the brain electrical recordings in the left prefrontal cortex. This was an area of the brain that increased during the generation of compassion while these sounds were being played. And, and this again is an average across four monks who went through these testing procedures. So, Your Holiness, I'd like to end with um, a statement that you made uh, that I would like to read to the audience. Uh, this is a statement that was uh, in your book with Howard Cutler uh, on the art of happiness. The systematic training of the mind, the cultivation of happiness, the genuine inner transformation by deliberately selecting and focusing on positive mental states and challenging negative mental states is possible because of the very structure and function of the brain. But the wiring in our brains is not static, not irrevocably fixed. Our brains are also adaptable. Thank you. Your Holiness, I just want to mention that this is Antoine Lutz, who is uh, a postdoctoral fellow in my laboratory and who is trained by Francisco Varela. Mm. And so the, the continuum of training uh, is a wonderful part of this whole process. And uh, uh, we are very grateful to have him. And he was responsible for the research that, we've, that we're doing. Very good. I'd like to thank both of our speakers for bringing us much closer to the theme of emotion uh, as we see it both from the Buddhist and Western perspective. I'd also like to uh, underscore the significance, I think, of this last set of PowerPoint uh, slides, which represent a long period of collaboration between Richie and Mathieu, between uh, Western scientist, uh, an eminent scientist in the study of emotions, and a contemplative uh, Buddhist practitioner who has also studied emotion and worked hard to bring those emotions into some kind of personal control. That kind of training is not easy to find. We hear it from Steve Coslin. He's still on the lookout for the person who can do this for mental imagery. Thank you both for doing this extraordinary work together. You've already begun the collaboration. We're going to turn now to uh, the questions, the questions that have been raised. Quite a number of questions have been put forward, both by the Buddhist side and by the science side. I'd just like to hold up a few of these uh, from each of you. George uh, posed to us concerning the phenomenology of the affective domain. Also concerning the neural correlates that might be associated with certain distinctions that are made in the Buddhist typology. They raised a large question, which I think probably will be taken up more to this afternoon, concerning ethics, psychology, first-person perspective, and abstraction. Those questions from George. During your presentation, uh, a number of questions came up concerning what is the role of consciousness in emotion, the role it might play, why do we have destruct destructive emotions at all? Is there some evolutionary reason behind this. I think we have to remember, of course, that in the Buddhist context, there isn't necessarily a comparable sort of neo-Darwinian theory behind their understanding of emotion, but is there nonetheless a purpose to anger or such destructive emotions? 
uh, this question of traits versus states or skills. Can we think of emotions differently? And we'd like to begin with Your Holiness to see if you have remarks that you would like to make to these presentations. <laughs> He had some questions, but now he's forgotten them. <laughs> so let's start. Let's so start if, well, the conversation we'll begins, maybe it will Very good. come back. <laughs> Perhaps uh, this question concerning the role of destructive emotions, that seemed to be a, an important one. And I'm wondering whether some of the other Buddhist scholars can speak to that. Matthew, did you have something that you wanted to say? Well, just about the notion of uh, the destructive emotion being necessary in, in, from evolution point of view, that for instance, you gave the example of anger. And so, <clears throat> as you mentioned, uh, anger might be useful for overcoming obstacles, but is to which ex in which way anger is totally undesirable or, and at which time in the arising of anger does that uh, negative and destructive and afflictive effect occurs. So of course in general, if we think of our behavior, anger is, there's no uh, way that anger, when it appears in the mind and it has uh, developed in the mind, it's always afflictive, obscuring, and uh, destructive. It, it, it disturbs our own peace and it disturbs that of others. But now if we look more precisely and more finely in the way emotion arises, and uh, we say that each of those destructive emotions, if we look carefully in it, first of all they arise from the basic awareness, which is not, it's like the mirror, which is not yet tent in itself intrinsically tainted with negativity or obscuration. And so each of those negative emotions somehow has a particular quality, we could say, that can evolve into being obs obs obscuring or not. And one of qualities said to be with, associated with anger is clarity. When we get angry, there's something all our senses are mobilized, our mind becomes sharp. And so if we were able to simply recognize that the very moment it arises, and simply I'd recognize that clarity, but not let it evolve or at the chain reaction that will give rise to hostility and especially to the strong distinction between self and others that, that creates the wish to, to harm or to destroy or to discard whatever. But simply recognize that moment of clarity and not let the thought increase and multiply and then it will not necessarily have a destructive uh, aspect. So of course we are talking of very no. fine moments. <laughs> and similarly, attachment has a notion of uh, some kind of bliss or, or desire, but if it turns into craving. So this is of course very subtle, but it means the, the point we want to make here is, I think from a Buddhist perspective, if we look at the the ultimate nature of mind, it doesn't contain those negative factors intrinsically. They are not part of that luminous basic aspect of mind. They are sort of deviation when those thoughts chain one after the other and become obstructing and destructive. George, I'm just wondering, before we go to, to you, this, this aspect of the intrinsic nature or non-intrinsic nature of the destructive emotions, is, there, is that something which any of you would like to comment on? Do you see uh, these afflictive emotions, for example, as having an intrinsic biological basis that is somehow constitutive to what it means to be a human being? Well, there's no doubt that emotions themselves do. It's not clear that other animals have mental imagery. It's not clear that they have control over cognition. It is very clear that they have emotion. Uh, emotion is generated by those areas of the brain that we share with all other mammals. And so I think the study of emotion is particularly important uh, from the evolutionary point of view. Um, 
In Buddhism, certain emotions are labeled as disturbing or afflictive, and Buddhist practice helps us eliminate those fear is probably a good example, but evolutionary biologists have a word for animals that don't experience fear, and it's called dinner. <laughs> right? Dinner. Dinner? So emotions such as fear are very important aspects. Oh, I see, I see. Excuse me. The dinner stores you're thinking of in particular? Can you repeat the last thing about the dinner? Say it again. He wants to get the joke. Yeah, repeat it and say it again. Oh, evolutionary biologists have a word for animals that do not experience fear. Dinner. What do you mean? Ah, they're preyed upon. Yeah. They die. Fear is a very important... Those animals who are afraid oh, survive. Okay, okay, okay. Those right. animals who do not okay. are eaten. Got it. Are okay. eaten. Exactly. And, and evolutionary... <laughs> so, here's, here's what I... It's an important point. It's an evolutionary advantage. Chitane え、ちかしゃべのロンラウシャイだ。かしゃいや他在那的,我們說那不是別緊,去考的,那不是別的緊,他在等緊馬塞吧,也別緊的呀,他在學過可能的呢,呀,你沒有給啊,給,或者是自己也別的啦,呀,第一天呢嘛,這個這個,他是
Another point that um, uh, he would like to raise is the, the complexity of the issues involved when we are studying something like emotion, such as even a single instance like anger. Um, it is very difficult to try to understand anger simply as a, a very short-lived, reactive, impulsive state, which is comes out and goes where, you know, comes out from nowhere and then disappears. Uh, because from the Buddhist point of view, mental states are understood in terms of processes which have continuum. So there are many other factors come into play. So in some individuals, the anger may be more long-lasting. But in some individuals, for example, one would expect a practitioner who is highly trained in the cultivation of compassion, he or she may experience intense anger under a given circumstance. But one would expect, because of the other factors, such as the strong compassionate practice, the anger would be much more short-lived. So there are many factors that has to, has to be taken into account. The, the physio <laughs> biological uh, constitutions of the individual, which uh, uh, may have and also environment. certain proneness towards you uh, know, one emotion or the other, environmental condi conditions under which the individual is living or happens to be. So all of these need to be taken into account. So it's very difficult to try to understand the nature of emotion like anger simply by looking at the emotional expression or just that state. First, George, I think you had a comment. George wanted to bring in. A... I want to take a, uh, put forth a little provocative idea, but which I think is pretty much probably in the line of what has been talked about. In a way, the problem with anger is not anger itself, but is the lack of freedom that we have. For example, if we, if we were freely entering into a brief burst of anger and then coming out of it, I think that would not be a problem. In fact, I don't think it would qualify as anger in any way. I, this is not what Buddhists mean by afflictive uh, emotions because the person remains in full control. And so the expression of this kind of wrathful energy would come out. Uh, and, and because it's in the, the control of the person, that would not be uh, uh, afflictive. That would not be a problem. It would not, it would help the person uh, protect himself or herself, accomplish what he or she wants to do. Uh, the, the real problem, uh, the, the deep-seated problem here is that anger is arising us and we have no control. We are just taken by, carried away. And this is really uh, what I think is, uh, is a problem. So I think, uh, in a way, the, the problem is not uh, about the Emo uh, uh, the emotions that evolution has brought about, but it's more about how we deal with them. Okay. Maybe I could go to this side, Alan, first. Dacca? Uh, one of the things that West, the Western scientific study of emotion has done is broken emotion down into many different pieces. So we talk about the appraisal and the intentional object and the feeling and the sensation and a tendency to act in a certain way and express it. And so I think the question we would turn back to you is, what is it freedom from? Is it freedom from feeling? Is it freedom from being obliged to act in a certain way? Is it a, feel, a feel, freedom from being aware of particular sensations? And how, what does the training focus on? Well, I think that f the freedom uh, is uh, the freedom from being compelled the problem is not the sensation. The problem is not even the, the energy with, which comes in the person in reaction to the external event. It's how this sensation brings about this mental state which just takes us away without any possibility of choice and leads us to really 
feeling miserable, to being aggressive, to, to uh, uh, beat up other people, and so on. So th this is really the key of the problem, and the, the, the heart of Buddhist practice is, in a way, the development of this metacognitive skills, which allows us to kind of, at first at least, notice this uh, reaction, and then channel, in a way, this energy in a, in a way which doesn't lead us to be carried away by uh, this negative uh, emotion. Alan, first, and then... There's a, a crucial issue here, and that is in Western theology and philosophy, whether or not we already have freedom of will is something that's been written about for tens of thousands of pages and you know, a couple of thousands of years. Buddhism don't even, Buddhists don't even ask whether the ordinary and untrained mind has freedom of will because it's so flagrantly obvious that we don't. <laughs> As George was talking about, somebody insults you and without any freedom whatsoever, you respond with anger and resentment and then you may be, you, and make faces and so forth, all kinds of expressions. There's no freedom here. And so it's very obvious that we're not starting out with freedom of will. In many cases we are not free, but then the whole Buddhist path consists of a path of cultivating freedom. So when you're enlightened, as, uh, as, as Ajahn Amaro said, when you're completely sane, then you are free to make wise choices at all times. Gobitunzetana, Ninji Gunelangi, um, George's um, point about the, the central point here being freedom um, and the lack of freedom when you experience these destructive emotions. His Holiness was saying that uh, he hasn't heard of this idea of freedom associated with the lack of freedom associated with the negative emotions, uh, destructive emotions before, but it, there is a point here. And this relates to uh, what he would normally uh, um, observe in emotions, that generally if you look at the, the emotional categories, uh, there seems to be one category of emotions which are more spontaneous, impulsive, um, and immediate. And sometimes there may be some uh, kind of uh, circumstantial reasons, for example, observing certain qualities of attractiveness or unattractiveness which may give rise to an emotion. But on the whole, these emotions are impulsive, immediate, and, and uh, 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 strong. But at the same time, there are other types of emotions which can be seen as kind of reason-based emotions, where as a result of a long process of contemplation or thinking, such as cultivating compassion, then you arrive at a point where you have a very strong feeling, intense feeling of compassion. And that kind of emotion is grounded in a more kind of reason thinking, kind of reflection. And uh, so he feels that a distinction needs to be made between these two types of emotion. So in the so in would the anger be spontaneous? Yes. So in the first category of emotion, then there is a lack of control. You know, and they come kind of, you know, they hit you. And there's a lack of control, there's a lack of freedom. Whereas in the second category of emotion, 
you know, regardless of how intense and strong they might be, there is still a degree of freedom on the part of the you know, subject. And in fact, one can envision this type of strong compassion being as the basic kind of motive and then can even giving rise to strong sense of disapproval and in fact wrathful kind of emotions which could that angers me one though, you know, could no. you know regardless of whether we would call that emotion anger or not is a mm. semantic issue but one could you know imagine a strong compassion as a base giving rise to a sense of kind of disapproval and giving rise to a strong feeling of kind of um, anger which could actually um, lead to a strong positive action. So here, this type of anger is slightly different from the, the normal It's a positive chodo, constructive chodo. So here we can see an instance, a possibly an instance of anger which is positive. We've got a couple. Do you want to make a comment That's first? Okay. Danny? I'm impressed by the relationship between freedom and self-control. That is, it seems that in this tradition and in some other traditions, including actually the Jewish one, freedom is self-control. Mm -hmm. uh, you achieve self-control by freedom. And self-control seems to be a skill. And skill, we learn from research in psychology, is acquired by, in general, by very long practice. And so the picture that is emerging is a picture that you can probably train your emotions, but if it is like other skills, the psychologist uh, Herbert Simon has claimed that to acquire real mastery on a skill across many different kinds of skill, like chess playing and violin, and I would assume a high level of compassion, uh, may take up to 10,000 hours of practice. So that, that is one of yeah, uh, the pictures that, yes. that are emerging here. I would point out that there is other research in I'm sorry. In some Buddhist texts, there's a reference to um, generally, uh, generally uh, three innumerable eons. <laughs> three innumerable eons. <laughs> 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 question is whether the grant runs out before the end of the experiment. grant <laughs> 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 Dan, did you want to add something on this point as well? Well, uh, also, um, I was thinking as I listened to our Buddhist friends speak, like Danny, I was struck that the notion of freedom and self-control are very, very similar. And the benefits of that freedom are just all too clear. They almost don't need a discussion. I think an interesting question is, are there costs? And in psychology, the cost of the sort of freedom you're talking about is time. The sort of freedom that you're discussing requires the wisdom that one brings to acting or not acting on anger takes time, maybe only a moment, not 10,000 hours. But that's precisely why animals have emotions, because it's very important sometimes to act very quickly. So if you promised me an example of an emotional reaction, if there is an unexpected movement in my visual field, I will feel a little fear and I'll move away. If you promise to liberate me from that feeling and bring it under my control, I would decline the invitation. So I wonder if you could just speak a little bit about whether there are any costs in Buddhist philosophy to the sort of freedom that you're uh, describing. <laughs> Alan, would you like to address this? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to first add a corrective. 
And that is in the Buddhist understanding of the mind, and we've seen this reflected in um, George's lists, the 20, 20, uh, 51 mental factors. If one had time at leisure to inspect that with care, one would note that there was something that was uh, salient for its absence, or conspicuous for its absence, and that is fear was nowhere to be found. Fear was not among either the six primary or the 20 secondary or branch mental afflictions. Fear is not a mental affliction. Neither is suffering a mental affliction. And so fear may be virtuous. It may be neutral, that is ethically neutral, or it may be non-virtuous, but fear itself is not, a, not even a mental affliction, nor is it non-virtuous. In fact, there are certain types of meditative practice where you cultivate a sense of fear that is based in reality in order to overcome the fear by taking the necessary steps. So the fact that we do have so, so many Buddhist monks who survived to the present day suggests that they didn't become <laughs> dinner. <laughs> A lot of Buddhist monks are still surviving, so they didn't become dinner. They didn't get eaten. And the same can be true, uh, the same is true of suffering itself. Let, let's uh, let them have the joke as well. <laughs> 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 and finally, very briefly, suffering itself is not a mental affliction. Even though that sounds rather strange in, in terms of the words itself, a mental affliction is that which disrupts the mind, disturbs the mind, roils the mind, warps the mind. If one attends to another person who is grieving and feels empathy and sorrows with that other person, the sorrow one feels, a transient sorrow that one feels in empathy, is not a mental affliction is in fact the, the, the wood, the fuel, from which the flame of compassion arises. And so not all suffering is, some, some suffering may be afflictive, some may be neutral, some may be actually wholesome. Likewise with joy. There, are, there is joy that is non-virtuous or, not, or afflictive, joy that's neutral, joy that's virtuous. But fear itself, just coming back to that, is not something that we're out to demolish uh, right from the outset. There may come some point at which fear, fear is no longer necessary, but that may be a while. And you, you wish to also? I just, I just wanted to <clears throat> say a few words about that notion of freedom and being same as self-control. Because often we think in the modern world that freedom would be, the best freedom would be to do exactly what comes through one's mind. That would be, we think we are really free because whatever comes to my mind, I'm going to do it. <laughs> so the situation is that we are the slave of every single thought that arises in our mind. <laughs> we are just like a, a grass on the mountain top that, that sway wherever the wind blows. Or we are like, it's like, suppose it's like a sailor on its boat. You say, freedom will be, let my boat drift wherever the wind blows. So now, we think of self-control as something limiting freedom, but it's in fact, it's just like the sailor taking the helm of his boat and sailing to the direction he wants to go. So he's free to go where he wants to go. So in that sense, we speak of freedom. And why also we speak of freedom in that sense is that freedom precisely from the chain reaction of thoughts. Because when we are not free, it's not like when we supposedly there's a sudden movement that we escape that. That's, that's fine. Actually, we are free to sort of escape the danger. When we are no more free, it's the second instant that fear gives birth to a second thought of fear or a third thought of fear. And then we are completely paralyzed by fear or fear becomes such a disturbing mental factor that we completely lose our inner peace. We are completely in anguish, which is not necessary at all, but we become the slave of a all pervading fear that is, that is actually uh, imposing on our, on our freedom. So now, the whole point of the training will be precisely to try to act on the moment of that chain reaction. And there's many ways to do so. You can use antidote, as it has been explained, the thought of, say, anger arises. And that same moment, you will you'll try to bring a thought of patience, or compassion, or loving kindness, because as I mentioned, at the same moment, for the same object, we can't have both the wish to harm and the wish to love. So they might alternate, but not then incompatible in the same instant. So you might use antidote, and the more you bring the thought of loving kindness and compassion, the less there will be space in your mind for anger and aggressivity. So that's one way, and that's a very efficient way, a very safe way. The other way would be also to act on that chaining itself. When thoughts arise, and instead of powerlessly let it become two and three and four, just look at it and say, what's there? 
why should it multiply like that? What, in which way is it imposing on me? Mm -hmm. Does it have a weapon in its hand? Is it like a stone or a fire in my chest? Look at it. And the experience shows, from the point of view of when you try to do that, when you sort of look at it instead of letting it multiply, it just vanishes. We give the example of the sun shining on morning frost. It just vanishes. It's simply because we are not mindful. We are not vigilant the moment the thoughts arise. We are not aware even of it. So of course it starts to multiply. And then when it's too late, it's like the spark. You, it's very difficult to control a forest fire. But at the time of the spark, you can do something much easier. So the freedom is precisely not to let you let this fire spread throughout your mind. And so at that time, it's much easier. And freedom means exactly that you don't let that chain reaction occur. Thank so we give another example, because images are very useful. Instead of uh, uh, carving in stone, like anger will be like a, a drawing or a letter carved in stone. It's like a drawing on water. As it forms, it unfolds itself. And therefore, there's an element of freedom in it. You know, one of the themes that has come up again and again and again is around this question of, of trainability. You know, for example, can we become more reliable in our retrospection, in our looking back on emotional states? Or uh, can we be in more conscious of uh, our emotions overall? Uh, can we transform our emotions? Can we become free? This is a theme which is obviously coming again and again. And, and I don't know that we have a clear picture from the scientific side how you understand skill development or trainability and what's not trainable, you know, from the science side, what, what seems to be intractable? Or how do you react to this, uh, these claims concerning trainability and skill development? Danny, do you want to start us off? Well, it, you know, it, it makes perfect sense from, I think, what we know about skill acquisition, that this is a skill that could be acquired. That is, if you put yourself repeatedly in situations mentally, and we clearly this is something that we can do, and you control your reaction to this time and time and time again, and you do this over time, uh, you know, I don't know how many thousand hours it will take, but ultimately this is the kind of skill that uh, could be acquired. There may be differences, I thought, between the skill of controlling negative emotions and the skill of maintaining compassion. And I was very curious about to ask actually, to ask you, which of these is considered more difficult and more advanced? My guess would be that it might be easier to control the negative ones than to promote the positive ones, but this is something that I would very much like to hear about. Is there a, a quick response you'd like to give, Alan? Uh, I think it really does de depend on the individual, the kind of ind individual background that, you, uh, that you're bringing to the plate, so to speak. Some people are simply not so particularly inclined to anger. And some are very, very sharp, very easy, uh, easily aroused to anger, but it's very brief. Other people are aroused to anger, but it lasts a long time. And likewise for compassion, we see children, very young children, who all those already display a natural propensity for compassion. And for others, it's much more difficult. It uh, takes a lot much longer to uh, cultivate. So it's individual, I think. Richie, did you want to add something? Uh, one of the uh, challenges that we, we have faced in the West in, um, uh, in uh, treatment of patients with mental disorder, uh, as well as in, in, in this domain, is how to figure out which individuals would benefit most from which particular kinds of practices or treatments or training. Uh, and ideally, uh, it, it, uh, is there something that we could know about the person before he or she actually begins the training to know whether a particular kind of training would be most appropriate for that person? So Alan spoke about a person who may have different propensity to anger, and presumably there would be different training methods that one might utilize. Uh, I think we do say indeed that we should attend to whichever of those mental afflictions is stronger first, because that's the main task. Someone who is more prone to anger or more prone to craving, to say among those afflictive emotions, we should first sort of concentrate with antidotes or with other means on that particular one. And so that's why it says it's a very flexible approach which 
It depends on the, each and every nature and each and every disposition. And so we sort of emphasize when we speak of 84,000 entries in the Buddhist path, it just precisely emphasizes the incredible variety of dispositions of sentient beings and the methods used to transform their minds. For, for those individuals who may not be particularly aware or conscious of what their major style of affliction might be, um, is there a Buddhist manual of assessment uh, that... <laughs> <laughs> there, are, there are many. Maybe you could give, an, could you perhaps give an example of the way in which a Buddhist, uh, say, abbot might assess the uh, afflictions of one of their... <laughs> I was just reading a passage in one of the Buddhist sutras where the, the Buddha uh, described how one, what, how one goes about evaluating another person. And he said, by being with this person for a long time and speaking with them and examining them carefully. So it's not, it's not brain science, but it is behavioral science. By very careful inspection to see what types of behavioral traits, characteristics, tendencies they display. And upon the basis of that, this is where the real teacher or mentor and disciple relationships comes in. The mentor having very carefully evaluated the particular predispositions of the student, then doesn't just, just give uh, prepackaged techniques for everybody who walks in the door, but hand tailors them for the individual. So as an example, in the attention training that I spoke about yesterday, there's not just one or two techniques. There's a wide range of techniques, depending on the particular proclivities, okay. dominant mental afflictions, and so forth. So for example, a person who is very strongly oriented towards anger and hatred, this person will be encouraged from the outset to spend a lot of time, as exactly as Matthew was suggesting, cultivating loving kindness, that which is diametrically opposed to hatred and anger. A person whose mind is compulsively involved, we come back to the issue of freedom, compulsively involved in just conceptual proliferation, just can't stop this, 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 you know, this proliferation of thinking, such a person encourages to watch the breath, to settle down, calm down. And so likewise, for a number of other kind of typologies, there are very specific techniques that have been found to be most effective for balancing the mind, not only the attention, the emotions, cognition, as a preparation for really investigating nature of reality. The, the, the lengthy observation period that you spoke about that would be required for this would certainly pose a real challenge to manage care. Um, <laughs> 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 Matthew, I have a small story if you allow me. There was a famous 19th century teacher called Patrouge Moshe and the way to examine how the students has predominant afflictions. So he came once in a hermitage place and there was a hermit there so he just came in and said, oh, what are you meditating upon? And the one said, meditating on patience. So Bhattacharya looked at him and then he stayed a little bit and sort of went around and the guy sort of a little bit nervous that this person is coming to disturb his meditation. And after a while, Bhattacharya looked at that meditator and said, oh, two ch uh, cheat like us are, are, were meant to meet. To meet. Yeah. <laughs> say, it, say it again. Huh? Say it again more clearly. Say two kind of, how do you say? Uh, shit. No, not shit, like shit. people who, who, who fool each other. Uh, to a cheat. Uh, to, cheat. To, to cheat like us were meant to, me to meet. Two cheats like us. Yes. Two cheats like us were meant to meet. <laughs> and so, <laughs> and so the we did a, two frauds. Two frauds like us were meant to two meet. Two frauds like us were meant to meet. Yeah, that's right. So then the mediator said, "What do you come disturbing? I'm trying to meditate on patience. Why are you coming disturbing me in my meditation?" <laughs> So Patrushim said, hey, where is your meditation now? <laughs> I'd like to uh, take up what is one of the, you might say, one of the great ambitions of uh, Buddhist meditation. And maybe it speaks to the hedonic treadmill question. You know, this was, a, seemed to me, a kind of core question that you asked towards the end of your, your presentation. Uh, if one's looking not just for transient satisfaction or happiness, but is actually looking for an enduring happiness, and happiness, again, not in the sense of gratification, but in the sense of true well-being, then how can this endure in the face of data which shows from the Western side that one again and again falls back into some low level of appreciation? I don't know, it might first be good to just say a little bit more from the Western standpoint about our understanding of this hedonic treadmill. I don't know if Dacker or 
Danny again? Okay. Go ahead, Danny. Well, uh, there are many results showing that changes in people's circumstances, including becoming richer or becoming poorer or becoming married or becoming widowed, uh, have transient effects, transient effects on the emotional state, on life satisfaction, on the happiness that people report, but that after a relatively short period, which can be measured in months or in years, uh, the level of happiness that people report experiencing comes back to what it was. So that is the, the main fact of the hedonic treadmill. But we also know that there are certain experiences that are not susceptible to the hedonic right. treadmill. So there are pleasures that remain. Can you give us an example? And well, certainly some pleasures of the mind remain and do not adapt. And I think that this, this would be considered, uh, this would be recognized in the West as well and not uh, only in the East. And, so, and, and there are also some physical pleasures that do not, that we do not adapt to, that, that remain pleasurable forever. But the issue of the hedonic treadmill plays a very important role because we seem to want things that it turns out do us no good in the long run. That is, there is a great deal of uh, activity in which we engage uh, to acquire goods that ultimately uh, give us no happiness. George, perhaps to start us off, George? Uh, yeah, I think I, I, I would like to make a, a, some important distinction. George, you could just wait for one minute for the translation. Or maybe he's talking about I think it's important to make a distinction when we talk about happiness because this is a term which is kind of can be taken in many in different ways and uh, the Buddhist often Buddhism often does say that the goal is happiness but uh, here, a very important distinction between pleasantness, uh, joy, and what I've called well-being. And it's clear that both uh, pleasantness and joy are, are short terms, and probably most of the pleasant experiences are subject to this erosion uh, which you describe, but I, I think it's very central to understand that the core uh, meaning of the word happiness here, in, in, in as much as it's promoted as a goal, is really this well-being, which has a sense of of, uh, of freedom, of uh, 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 flourishing, and is not tied down to any particular. Uh, experience which is by necessity uh, fleeting. So I think I would like to propose this distinction so that we start to talk in a broader sense about what is implied here when uh, it is said that the goal uh, uh, is happiness. Certainly the notion uh, that uh, pleasure is transitory is something which is very uh, uh, center, I mean, that the Buddhist tradition is keenly aware of. In fact, if I talk to my own experience, this is the first teaching I received from my first teacher, Geshe Ravden, who talked about that. And so, uh, when you talk about three types of suffering, so this is a very, uh, this understanding that the distinction has to be made between pleasantness, joy, and uh, well-being, I think, is, is very deeply embedded in the tradition. Thank you. You know, I'd like to see if there are any comments or questions. We're about to turn to the audience's questions, but before we do, whether there are any things that you would like to comment on concerning the presentation, especially from, from George, or the questions that have already, already been uh, dealt with, is there any further comments from this side? 
Dan? I, I would just echo, I mean, so much of this meeting is looking for discrepancies between Buddhist and psychological conceptualizations. And what George just said is a point of real agreement. It's very clear to psychologists that these, that pleasures are transitory. And what's so interesting is why people, ordinary people, have so little insight into the sources of their own well-being and happiness. And I think both traditions agree on that. There isn't a lot of mystery, I think, about why uh, people, and particularly Westerners, believe that transitory pleasures should last. We live in a society that's a consumer society. It's not meant to maximize our happiness. It's meant to maximize our consumption. We want our, to maximize our happiness. The society wants to maximize our consumption, and so we're taught that our consumption will bring us happiness. It turns out to be a lie, but we die soon enough and a whole new generation gets to believe it. <laughs> you know, one of the uh, interesting distinctions that was uh, Dacker? Um, in thinking about the hedonic treadmill and why pleasure and happiness is so transitory, uh, there's a, an interesting point that uh, the Buddhist practitioners have made that could really inform our science. We've thought about emotions as very object specific very fast reactions. You're talking about an emotion that arises or a state that arises through long contemplation. Um, it'd be interesting to hear about what those states are, uh, what they're like in terms of their feeling, because it's a, a, a window of opportunity for us to study. Can we address that at least briefly? What is it like to actually reside within a state of well-being as, as a trait or enduring skill? I'd like to speak very briefly and only to start off. And that is, I would, and, and with reference to the circumplex model that uh, Rajiv put up for us, and w in which uh, alert was high arousal and calm was, what was it called, deactivated? Deactivated. Excited, relaxed, elated, serene. In the, cult in the Buddhist cultivation of attention, you have something very anomalous taking place. On the one hand, it is very alert, and it's profoundly calm. It's not excited in the sense of agitated, but it's very, very happy. At the same time, it's profoundly relaxed, it's serene, and so you're getting both ends at the same time in an anomalous fashion, and that takes training. It's not the aroused attention of a video game player, a jet fighter pilot, an air traffic controller. It's something different. And it's either true or false, but it can be tested empirically. Yeah. Danny yeah. would like to... to this actually echoes... Just, just one second, I think he needs to translate. No, because I say we have a in the attention literature, uh, there was an old distinction between two kinds of attention. The attention that is essentially oriented to action, that is motor, and that one is high arousal, and the attention that is receptive and uh, oriented to accepting stimulation, and that is low arousal, that is present in, actually in animals, it's present in babies. It, it used to be a very central topic in the study of attention some decades ago, which has been lost since, <laughs> and clearly would be worth reviving in the context of this conversation. Thank you. I think we'd like to turn then to your questions, and Anne has uh, a few of them in hand. We, we have a lot of questions, and I've been sort of struggling to organize them and to also see how to bring as many of them in, onto the table as possible. And what I'm going to propose is that we maybe rather than have a whole round robin of responses to the different questions, that we try to be a little bit more punctate so more can get on the table. I'm actually holding nine questions in my hand. I'm going to see if we can get some of them. And some I might combine into a more, uh, a more global kind of question. I'm going to go sort of back and forth between the scientists and the Buddhists, because that's sort of how they seem to sort. And there are lots of questions to both sides. And I'm going to start with the Buddhists. But this is probably best originally um, to be answered by George. 
You say the mind is fluid and that there is no king. But what do you call the meditator's I who is doing the investigation? <laughs> We'd start with a hard one. Uh, in, uh, well, I, I, this is obviously a complex uh, uh, topic, but uh, the, the, the goal of the Abhidharma is precisely to understand this process of meditation investigation in impersonal terms. That is, what is doing the meditation is a number of factors which work in kind of synchronically or in, in, in interdependence with each other. And so the goal of the practice is really to promote these factors which will lead to uh, more uh, well-being, to greater freedom, and so on. And so it's not really me in any strong sense of the term who is doing the meditation. Now, obviously, we use this word because we speak conventionally, and there is no problem with that. And so conventionally speaking, yes, I am doing the meditation. Uh, and there is no denying that. But what we mean by I uh, is often has a very a much stronger connotation. And so to my response to, uh, to the question is, what, uh, what is the I which meditate? Well, the I which meditate in the strong sense of the word is what is to be eliminated by the meditation oh. itself. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to push right on. To, so we um, obviously could talk much more about all of these things. This is to Richie first. Um, and I think it and I think it also opens up some of these larger questions that we've been asking about where ethics, really, how ethics relates to methodology, how it relates to the scientific effort. As George pointed out, writes the questioner, in the Abhidharma, the category of virtuous, non-virtuous is defined by ethical, religious purposes, i.e. whether it leads to suffering or not. Can this categorization be used outside of this, of this ethical context, i.e., can it be used as a value-neutral categorization in the laboratory? Well, I, I think that um, uh, there are many ways to answer that question, but operationally, I think that uh, we certainly can use the framework of uh, virtuous and afflictive to distinguish between um, particular kinds of emotional states that are that might be generated in the laboratory uh, in individuals who uh, are not Buddhists, uh, in individuals who are not part of uh, uh, any one any particular religious or um, uh, uh, spiritual tradition, uh, in so far as. Uh, roughly speaking, we can think of virtuous uh, as something that will lead to a, um, a, 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 a reduction in those things that disturb the mind, that produce suffering, that lead to agitation, and virtuous um, uh, uh, and, and, and afflictive, the opposite. I think that we can use that scheme to begin to distinguish among emotions in a, in a different dimensional framework than we have used previously. But it's still a normative scheme. Pardon? It's still a normative scheme, or is it a value-neutral scheme? Well, I, I, it certainly, um, I mean, I think that uh, uh, it, uh, I, I, I think it's difficult to use that scheme without um, having it imply some value. I think this just keeping on with the um, sort of conversation about how we push this into the res in, into the laboratory. This is a question that now back to the monks that might potentially be participating in future studies. Um, as researchers, this is uh, a question from someone named Cassandra Vietin from the University of California in San Francisco. She says that researchers would like to have a method of measuring constructs like compassion. Now we know that you, this is not now, this isn't in the question, we know that you have these brain-based 
third person indices that you think might reveal something about compassion. But when it comes to the first person, the introspective measures, how can we measure compassion? How do you know when you are in a compassionate state? <laughs> and then, when in terms of then being able to report and being able to correlate the phenomenological dimensions to the biobehavioral dimensions. It seems so obvious, I don't know how to reply. <laughs> <laughs> are there, well, let me, there's a little bit more. How do you, are there any observable characteristics? I assume she means internally that can be measured. Well, measured, I don't know. You could describe what describe. are the characters of compassion. And of course, uh, it, is, uh, it has quite deep description, you know, like uh, the wish that being may not suffer and also may free from the cause of suffering. It's not just like pity, for instance. While loving kindness is not to be to love somebody or to like somebody, but it's the wish that person may find happiness and the cause for happiness. So there's a lot of factors there, because the cause of happiness comes with wisdom. The cause of suffering comes also with ignorance, with the other mental factors. So it's a much broader, uh, deep, uh, availability, uh, your mind it becomes completely pervaded by this wish that we being be free from suffering, we find a cause of happiness, and so it's ultimate benevolence that excludes any kind of thought that will be both self-centered and uh, self-motivated and also limited in the sense that you would uh, do that only for a certain number of beings. So it's a kind of all-pervading, we could say unconditional love and compassion. So it has, it has many characteristics which you could describe. But describing them and you could compare whether your compassion or your love is like focused, is limited, is fragmented. So you could see if it misses some qualities, but you are not going to measure it in terms of intensity, but whether it is pervaded with wisdom, it is polarized or universal. So all those things you could uh, sort of examine. Just to add one other thing, with Matthew's um, involvement and consultation, we actually did uh, in our work and continue to uh, ask the monks after each meditation practice to scale their experience on certain specific dimensions that have been suggested by Matthew as the relevant dimensions. And I can tell you that there is variation across periods that not every meditation does the, does the meditation produce intense um, compassion each and every time. There is some variation and it is represented in, in, in how they scale. How um, full maybe are complete it would be in the mind. How does that compare with the Is it uh, both, MRA, it, it, the question MRA. I think is, is the internal scale in more or less agreement with the external measured yeah. result? Uh, that's a, a, a critically important question and the honest answer is that we don't know yet. Uh, it's, it's more work too to early do. to tell. Tune in next year. Let me um, keep, this is another question that came out of your discussion of the collaboration between uh, Mathieu and Richie. And I guess, I guess it's for um, both of you. I, although I, I, it seems to be directed to Richie, but I think it should be to both of you. Was there a difference in Mathieu's response to the baby laughing versus the woman screaming? Uh, the, the preliminary answer is yes, there, there does seem to be a difference, but uh, um, it's very preliminary and we, we, the, the data are still being processed. So this is all very new. And you understand the implications that a baby laughing would be something joyful, a positive, and the woman screaming might elicit a different sort of, was, what, what in terms of your subjective memory of that? Well, it's exactly the, the love and compassion you know, are two facets. But actually, they are not intrinsically different. And we often associate loving kindness and compassion as one basic feeling. So when there is confronted with suffering, it seems like arising as compassion. When it's confronted with joy, it wants that joy to increase and it's appreciated. Mm -hmm. So it's more like a, a complete readiness towards sentient beings. You are completely ready to be available to alleviate suffering. You are completely available to further increase our happiness. This is a question um, that came up, I think, also yesterday morning, and has to do with the motivation on the sides of the on the Buddhist side of the partnership. And the questioner asks, "What if any form of evidence coming from the Western scientists' work 
might you use to modify or incorporate into your training? I think that's, uh, that's what we hope to find out by doing this collaboration. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, we are just beginning this collaboration and... Uh, is there anything that, or maybe to put the question another way, is there any way that you could imagine in principle that data coming from a laboratory, biobehavioral data, would cause you to modify the way in which you practice? Or is the internal reference in first person self-sufficient in itself? Well, in the sense that we're trying to investigate more finely the, the kind of what happens during meditation, and all those kind of feedback might help us ourselves to investigate further the first person and discriminate between mental factors or state which we, we were not able to discriminate so far. And by looking back and forward and trying to investigate more, we might be able to make finer distinctions. Yeah. Uh, it pertains to the point that Nancy made yesterday, and that is uh, even though the brain may not be very illuminating at this point, simply because it is so tremendously complex, there are very sophisticated behavioral measures that have been developed by psychologists. And Buddhists are also very, also make inferences about the mental states of students and so forth based upon behavior. So this is something that there could be a lot of, a great deal of complementarity. Uh, just getting another kind of another vantage point to try to evaluate whether a particular type of meditative practice is, practice is working or not. Having said that very briefly, there's also a cultural aspect here. And that is there may be some meditative practices that have worked extremely well for 1,200 years in Tibet. If you take exactly the same practices and put them in Boston in the year 2003, for quite a few people, they not, may, may not work very well. It's not because the practices are no good, but the context is so radically different. So that Buddhism has gone through a process of assimilation and adaptation for 2,500 years as it's gone to different cultures. This is what is happening now as well. We want to make sure that these practices can be just as effective here as they were in Tibet and India before then. This means very careful research and whatever help we can get, this is to everyone's advantage. And not only for Buddhists, but for the, we're all concerned with compassion, with greater well-being and so forth. So this, once again, this is really a match waiting to happen. Yeah, I'm, going to, I'm going to keep going. Um, let's this is still staying on. I'm sorry. That's all right. Go ahead. Sorry. Did you hear what the band did? No, because the other, that the body was not da. Then the atma only. You know, you need to conquer that. Right. That's some things you should not conquer. Right. That the shiro go chane da do da go jaro. That sanjeve kom jagi yare need to conquer yare kom gen ya da me bachi kita. Um, one, this is to follow up on uh, Alan's point about the possible um, cultural kind of specificity of some of the practices um, in the tradition. Uh, for example, like within the ancient Indian tradition, um, there are uh, non-Buddhist spiritual traditions where uh, the notion of some sort of enduring eternal kind of principle as an I or a soul or a self is central mm. to their spiritual tradition and many of the contemplative practices for enhancing compassion and reduction of destructive emotions are really built around that kind of uh, philosophical kind of premise. So it would be interesting to see, compare how, uh, whether they could, whether any kind of, you know, uh, you know, neural or biological kind of differences could be detected among the practitioners who are although cultivating the same emotion like compassion, but grounded in a different... And single-pointedness. And single-pointedness and many other uh, features of the meditative practice. So that would be an, an, an interesting area. I've got four more questions I'm going to try to put on the table. Two of them are about the sort of broader process of research, and two of them are about the applications or implications for, for non-scientists, for, for the general public. Um, here's the first of the, of the first set. In using, and then I'm going to look particularly first at, towards the scientist side, and then we'll see um, whether the Buddhists have something they want to add. In using highly trained meditators as subjects, how should scientists consider bias of self-selection? Highly trained meditators may have had well-balanced minds or special determinations to begin with. 
What do Buddhists think about the representativeness of these highly trained meditators? And then the, the questioner who's Mark Feinberg from Penn State goes on to say, and do scientists think they should be limited to experimental randomized designs? Well, uh, it is. Uh, it, it is an issue which we've thought a lot about. And um, a critic might say to us that the, uh, some of the unusual findings that we've obtained from the monks may have absolutely nothing to do with their training. Uh, if we were able to test them when they were young children before they began the training, maybe they'd show the same thing. That is a, a question which we have not yet been able to answer. In response to that very question, uh, we've been talking with Alan and with Matthew about doing longitudinal studies where we could test people at different points in time to follow, to follow the progress or the course of training so that each person can then be compared with him or herself before they began the training. And only that kind of design will allow us to definitively eliminate the hypothesis that it's purely self-selection, which we have not yet done. Uh, I should mention that in work that I've done with John Kabat-Zinn, uh, uh, with people who are naive, who have not been doing meditation before, where we taught them, John taught them meditation, uh, a simple mindfulness practice. In that study, we did test people before and after uh, a two-month, very short, a two-month program in meditation. And there were changes that we were able to detect before versus after. So those changes couldn't have been exclusively uh, a function of self-selection. We've been using the metaphor of the, of the Olympic athletes um, of, the, of, of, of mental ability and maybe compare, you, you don't expect, you expect that every, you can send every kid to gym class and he or she can become more fit, but you wouldn't expect every individual to have the ability to become an Olympic athlete. So maybe there is going to be some sort of a balance between innate ability and trainability that ultimately you're going to make, make, will make clear why, for example, Steve Koslin hasn't yet been able to find his Olympic athlete of imagery, uh, doesn't mean that there isn't one out there. Um, let me keep going. I sort of like this one. What does the Western scientist's emphasis on not treating Buddhists just as guinea pigs, but as collaborators, say about our Western scientific treatment or attitude towards non-special subjects? <laughs> <laughs> That's from Mark Feinberg from Penn State. Anyone can jump in, I guess. I'll let my colleagues Well, it's, it's always in good humor to use the word guinea pig and laugh as if scientists and psychologists treat people as mere subjects, but Anybody who does psychology or reads psychology knows that those who participate in experiments are treated with the utmost respect for their welfare and well-being, and that anything that happens to them in a laboratory is uh, thought carefully about by the scientists, by a variety of governing institutional boards. So we may use the word guinea pig jokingly, but perhaps we shouldn't, because it, it wouldn't be a joke if subjects were treated that way. Okay, here's a, a question, and this begins to um, open up to the larger issue of the implications or usefulness of this sort of work to the general public. Have you done similar research on adept meditators who are not monks? It seems as if, as if, if you could show these same results in lay people, we could benefit more people because more people can relate to lay yogis or meditators than they can to monks. Any comments on, this is probably really, you're, Richie, you're sort of the only one who's been doing this work, and you mentioned the Kabat-Zinn study, the work you did with John. Yeah, well, uh, I think it's a very important question. I appreciate the 
the motivation of the questioner, I think that there is something important that, that is being addressed in that question. And um, we certainly uh, would be extremely interested, and we have tested some individuals who have not been monks. Um, so uh, it hasn't all been monks, but uh, um, uh, we, the, the, the issue for us has, one of the things that scientists uh, prefer in doing research of this kind is to have individuals who've all gone through very, very similar training. Uh, and if we can find a pool of individuals who are not monks that have gone through very similar training, mm -hmm. um, that would be very helpful. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that we've been talking to Alan about is, uh, is lay people who go through a long-term retreat who are not monks mm -hmm. uh, to look at longitudinal changes uh, as a consequence of that. I think Alan wanted to... Yeah, and uh, like your project with uh, John Kabat-Zinn, there was the project uh, conceived in the year 2000 Mind and Life Conference by Paul Ekman, carried through with the present uh, princi princi principal investigator being Margaret Kemeny. Margaret Cullen and I are the co-trainers for this. This is teaching school teachers, uh, teaching them a secularized version, uh, versions of Buddhist meditations, but with none of the theoretical framework. Uh, but this is exactly that, longitudinal studies to see whether some of these basic practices of mindfulness, of compassion, loving kindness can help them in their daily lives, at home and at work. So this research is ongoing. It's very exciting work. Mm. So I just want to say in the first step, the, the, the criteria for doing those experiments and inviting some person to participate was not at all whether they are monks or not. We just look how many years of practice they have been doing. So it just happened that most are a little bit kind of professional, so they have been longer time. But we are very much hoping, for instance, to have people who have done retreats in the West, and those are majority not monks, and it's just because it didn't happen for the time being, but we, are, I think, really very much want to continue to spend with them. So right. I, the monk or not is not the issue at all. That we actually used as an informal criterion the 10,000 hour requirement. And wow. It limited our sample initially. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is Anyone out there? Oh. This is a question now more explicitly to, to the Buddhist side, uh, but it also concerns sort of practical, how to think about this in practical terms uh, for, for ordinary people. Buddhism mental, Buddhism mental training strives to bring about freedom, you've argued. When freedom or more freedom is achieved through training, how does it translate into action? And here's the difficulty that the questioner is having. If there is freedom, there is choice. How does one with freedom choose without relying on valence or assigning different values to the option at hand? To go where one wants to go, doesn't it require wanting something, which is an attachment, or avoiding something? Okay. <laughs> well, I think that there's a, there's a difference between uh, an aspiration and a desire, for instance. You may aspire to the well-being of humanity without being, it's not a craving, it's not an attachment, because an attachment is something that precisely limits your capacity of having a right judgment about how to bring the well-being to humanity. So it doesn't mean that you don't have any values, that you don't have any even emotions. It's simply that those are not afflictive. And so definitely, if you were to speak in basic, basic values, to remove suffering and bring well-being, those are values that will be universal and most fundamental. And you can actually evaluate precisely how to use your freedom in terms of dispelling suffering and bringing happiness. Uh, I think those values will be totally acceptable and not limiting, in fact, your, act, your freedom. Okay, and right from that point, George has brought to our attention the triad of three of the primary mental afflictions of delusion and craving and anger or hostility. His Holiness has already addressed the possibility of there being compassion-inspired anger that's not afflictive. Psychologists are well, well aware of the fact that there is an attachment, for example, the bonding between, between mother and child that is not afflictive, that is in fact crucial for our survival. Uh, but when Buddhists speak of attachment and host hostility as mental afflictions, both of these have a com common denominator, and they are, they are arising from the root of delusion. In attachment, I am falsely or delusionally superimposing the source of my happiness to an object. In afflictive anger, I am delusionally superimposing the source of my suffering to an object. And so the afflictive attachment, afflictive anger are both delusional. And being deluded, you're not free. <laughs> 
freedom is free of freedom is freedom from delusion, in which case your, your aspirations and so forth are reality based rather than delusion based. I've got one more management Similarly, when, uh, similarly um, when we speak of the sense of self, uh, although self is um, existence of intrinsically real self is rejected, but again, in the sense of self, one could speak of uh, a positive sense of self, which seems to be actually required in order to have a strong self-confidence. Mm -hmm. You need to have a strong sense of self, which then serves as a basis. You could also have a, an afflicted sense of self, which is much more constricting and delusional. Similarly, uh, when we speak of desire, there could be two types. There could be positive one, constructive one, which is non-deluded. There could be afflicted desire. I keep getting hand. Let a woman In fact, there is a recognition in the Buddhist tradition that uh, on the beginner's stage, even the practitioners can have um, <coughs> uh, spiritual states of mind such as compassion and devotion and so on, faith and so on, which are inspired by uh, um, grasping at self-existence, grasping at self and ego. Mm -hmm. I, I've got, I've just was handed a, another pile of questions, um, and I've just slipped two of them in. I'm going to, there, there are three questions I'm holding here that have to do with development and have to do with the age at which training might be introduced into, a, in, in, into someone's life. Um, one of the questioners asks about introducing med the meditative techniques into the school system and how early children can be introduced to such techniques. She's, he or she is very practical. How do we begin? How, do we, how might we do this? Um, but the, there's another question about how Buddhists themselves um, train children in these practices. What age do meditative techniques begin? Do children trained in this tradition exhibit significant emotional differences from other children? Uh, and again, a third question. Uh, we're trying to be very practical in this dialogue. We want to use this information to change humanity towards a path of goodness. Uh, so in this sense, what can the contemplatives on stage here comment on the techniques used, this is quite similar actually to the other question, used by lay Buddhists in raising their children uh, in the home and in the school system. If the training is started in the home or at elementary school age, we would all come to the plate with a greater baseline virtuous temperament by, by adulthood. So this is a set of questions that really have to do with childhood, with children, and both how in the indigenous context, um, Buddhist people who are Buddhist, Buddhist practitioners train their children, and then how we might translate that into a Western context, specifically the questioner asked about the school context. Jimpa should answer this one. Yeah. Yes, Jimpa. That'd be great. <laughs> You have so much more than that. So actually, from, from what we see in the Tibetan society, or it's not really uh, maybe done in a systematic way, but it it's comes naturally because children are exposed very early to a certain way of life, to people who are used to practice, and they, 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 they see their, their, their family, uh, even lay families in, in Tibetan society engage a lot every day in prayers, meditation, and uh, maybe not the way of meditation we think about, sitting under a mango tree, but uh, more like uh, cultivate training their mind in a way. So it's something they're exposed very early, and uh, it's quite remarkable how young children can, can get something of that. And of course, in monasteries, uh, we're sometimes surprised to see very young uh, novice. And it's not that they have been dumped there by their parents and crying and want to get out, but very often they 
they're actually happy to go there rather than to go to school. And you can see a development of a very, uh, it's a kind of very certain atmosphere. I must say I'm quite struck when we pass near a school, I, I did so recently in Paris, at the time of the, between the classes, there's so much noise and everybody running and they fight each other and all that. It's almost, we don't see that somehow. It's very, very rare to see among 50 children uh, the, young, the young novice monks who get the, the training there. It's extremely rare to see them fighting each other or sort of uh, this kind of extreme outburst of emotions. So there must be something that at a very early age favors some kind of little bit sure. more like a serene and peaceful and, and sort of loving yeah. atmosphere that must come from the whole environment and from being exposed to the example. I think the best way is when the parents themselves are practitioners. And so naturally, in every uh, daily activity, and the way they relate and speak to their children, it is bound to be the strength of example uh, that, that works the best. And if I may say, from the experience of uh, one of my teachers, whose grandfather was an a very great teacher, he said in the very beginning of his life, he saw his, grandfa he saw the, his teacher as, as his, a very kind and loving grandfather. And slowly, growing with age, then he started discovering him as a spiritual teacher. And, but, and then he found in him all the qualities of a spiritual teacher. And so it, it begins with teaching through human values. And then slowly, the, what is behind the, human, the cultivation of human value, which we find in the teachings and in the practice, come and blends. There is a remarkable uh, school that I've been visiting now and then, just intermittently over the last 33 years in Dharamsala, the Tibetan Children's Village. And I've, I have been struck every, sing, every single time I visited there over 33 years um, by the quality of the children there. It has like 2,000 children from babies in arms who are orphans to 18-year-olds who are about to graduate from high school. It's not, it, it's, it's, not, it's not a Buddhist monastery, it's a school system, but Buddhist principles are brought in very early on. The children are taught about empathy, about compassion, there are role models all over the place. There are monks coming in and out intermittently. Uh, they have their heroes. Uh, if I may say just quite, quite candidly, their greatest hero is His Holiness the Dalai Lama. It's not a rock star. It's not basketball players. It's not um, muscle men uh, and so forth. Uh, or politicians. And the people you admire are the ones you're most likely to become like. Yeah, I think what we are talking, I mean, what I, I think is important is the development of the kind of backfield of skills emotional skill, cognitive skill, metacognitive skills, and this seem to me extremely important. And if I think about my own experience, in a way, I was a kind, I didn't get all the skills I needed, and in a way, my coming to see uh, Tibetans, His Holiness, and all my teacher was a way for me to acquire these uh, skills. And I think it would be really important if we could find ways which are not Buddhist or not bound with any tradition to develop certain of these skills. The problem, obviously, is what you have mentioned, the 10,000 hours. It ain't easy. But I think it's important for everybody. At the same time, spiritual life is not like a, 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 diet, a, 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 like a vitamin supplement. You, know, you can play piano or not play piano, that's fine. But we don't mind spending 15 years to you know, acquire knowledge and professional training. We do jogging for our health. And somehow we don't feel that's that much important to spend time to, for inner development. So that's kind of very surprising. <laughs> We come to the end of our. Solinus would like to thank the three uh, Buddhist speakers for their very glorying, um, glorying, uh, uh, glorified descriptions of the Tibetan society. But he feels that probably if you deduct 10% of what they said, <laughs> then would be closer to the truth. <laughs> <laughs> so we have come to the, the end of our morning session. Uh, once again, a special thanks to Richie and to Mathieu, not only for their presentations, but also for their 
example of George, ongoing George. collaboration. George. I'd like George. to thank George Dreyfus for his lucid presentation of the Abhidharma uh, system, which is not about emotions, we now know, but uh, may only look that way. Thanks also our scientists and, of course, His Holiness the Dalai Lama. We're going to be coming back again at 1.30. Uh, as you saw, we tend to, tend to start punctually. It may even happen that we start early. So come early, uh, and we'll go for another session of the investigating the mind. Great.